Members, um, and welcome to the 56th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf, and our witnesses will be briefing us via Starleaf as well. So the meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. And just to ask members to mute their devices when they're not speaking. So um, moving on, item number one is apologies, and we have apologies from Gordon. I don't think we have any other apologies. Um, not that I'm aware of at the minute. Oh, sorry, we... No, no, no. Gary, Gary. Oh, uh, Gary. apologies also from Gary. So moving on then to item number two, which is Chair's business. Um, and just to remind members that the committee agreed the clerk would meet with a representative of the independent wedding venue sector to ascertain how that sector had fared during lockdowns. The committee met with Sarah Mackey of Larchfield Estate, who was representing a, a large group of independent wedding venues. Unlike other hospitality or tourism businesses, these venues have not been able to conduct any other business. Additionally, it's likely that there will be a time lag before weddings begin again, even when venues can open up. And in many cases, these venues have not been eligible for assistance since the initial 25k and 10k grant schemes. Many now find themselves in considerable financial difficulty, and I'm sure some members have been contacted in relation to this issue as well. So if members are agreed, we would write to the Economy Minister and Executive to highlight the issues that have been highlighted by the sector and seek some support for these venues and in um, in many cases their suppliers also and members will have, I'm sure, been uh, contacted by businesses in those sectors as well. Peter, is there anything you want to add to that? Chair, just that um, we, we had a good conversation. I've gathered up a lot of information about this um, Sarah Mackey's been really helpful in bringing that together for me. So I'll write all that information up and send that in the letter to the uh, executive and the minister. Um, some, some areas of the sector have had some help where it's smaller venues, but the larger venues just in so many cases didn't meet criteria. So that's really why we need this extra push. Okay. Are members content then that we would um, write to the minister and executive just to highlight those issues? Can't see any members. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Um, and then, so moving on to item two point two, uh, the clerk yesterday afternoon forwarded a response from the minister in relation to the college lecturers' industrial dispute. The minister had highlighted that there would be industrial action today. Um, the committee considered correspondence yesterday at our meeting in relation to pay issues from a, a college lecturer. Just to remind members that the committee's role is restricted to urgent engagement between management lecturers and the department and has no role, obviously, in the determination of lecturers' pay and conditions or industrial disputes. And also just to remind members that Claire Sugden has previously declared and recorded an interest on this issue as her, her husband is a college lecturer. Um, and I think it's, it's some, yeah, John O'Dowd is wanting to come in there on this issue. Can we bring John into the spotlight, please? It's Tommy. Tommy, can we bring John O'Dowd into the spot? You hear me now, sir? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I, I think the minister's letter of yesterday, um, while she may not have a direct role in resolving this dispute, sometimes it's better to say nothing. And I think in this case, the minister's letter may have uh, created more difficulties than solved problems and created a more difficult atmosphere for the needed negotiations to take place in. Um, I don't think it was helpful to the situation at all. Okay, thanks, John. Um, and I'm sure individual members may may have, uh, um, may have want to express their, their solidarity with lecturers or those things as well, so that's perfectly acceptable to do. Can we bring Sinead McLaughlin into the spotlight, please? Yeah, um, thank you very much for bringing me in. Uh, and I, I, I don't think any union or indeed members of a union want strike action. And unfortunately, that's where we are today um, with the FE uh, lectures. Uh, and I would urge, um, you know, the minister in particular to, to, to be very, very conservative with her, with her comments. And we need to make sure that the situation is resolved. Uh, and there's re-engagement and negotiation that takes place as soon as possible uh, without any further delay. That's all I would say. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sinead. Okay, so I hope I think we have covered that. So moving on then to item number three, which is matters arising at page six of our packs. There's a response from UK Finance to the committee's letter regarding bank closures. UK Finance has stated that banks pay play particular attention to the needs of customers in vulnerable circumstances when considering branch closures and that banks follow extensive due diligence processes to access customer impact when considering a bank closure. So just to remind members that the committee is due to have an informal meeting with UK Finance and representatives from the banks on the 29th of April and we have also written to the Financial Conduct Authority around this issue and are due to have an oral briefing from the Financial Services Union on the 21st of April. So this, uh, correspondence, or this correspondence is to note for now um, and obviously we are looking at this issue in more detail so are members content to note? Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number four, which is our departmental briefing um, on the energy strategy. There is a clerk's memo at page nine of your pack. There's a departmental briefing paper at page 13 and a report from the University of Exeter on um, energy governance for the NI energy transition at page 18 of your packs. And then there is a copy of the committee's energy strategy micro inquiry report at page 74. So, um, can I welcome to the meeting uh, Richard Rogers, who is head of Energy Group in DFE, and Thomas Byrne, who is director of Sustainable Energy in DFE. And if I hand over to yourselves to, to make a, an opening statement and give us a bit of an update, and then we'll bring members in for questions. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just going to quick off very quickly. It's Richard. Um, we briefed the committee on, in March and June last year on the development of the energy strategy. And we're delighted to be back today just to provide some further update. Um, now that we're on the cusp of the publication of options consultation next Wednesday, um, by the end of March, as we had promised. Um, as you mentioned, we've sent over just about a four page update, and I'm going to ask Thomas just to very quickly say a few words to that so we can then move on. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so, thanks to Richard for the introduction. Uh, it's Thomas Byrne here. Um, and the opportunity to provide an update on the energy strategy to the committee. Uh, I want to focus on the key developments since we last provided an update and also some of the key issues and contents of the options consultation that will launch next week. So we've previously set out the process that we've gone through to gather and analyse evidence for the consultation, the call for evidence, the working groups that have been established and so on. But a new key part of this has been the establishment of an expert panel. Uh, and this has brought expertise from across the UK and Ireland that we've met with on almost a monthly basis uh, to provide insight and challenge uh, that helps to shape our thinking around the strategy. And this has been invaluable over the last number of months as we develop this consultation. I want to start with the proposed vision with, for, for, the, for the energy strategy, which we have put forward as net zero carbon and affordable energy. There's two key elements to this. The first is net zero carbon energy. When the, climate, when the Committee for Climate Change released its sick carbon budget in December last year, it recommended that the UK should aim for net zero in all emissions no later than 2050. Northern Ireland's fair and equitable contribution to this was seen as being a reduction of 82% in all emissions by 2050, mainly due to the size of our agriculture sector and the reliance across the UK on it. However, within this advice, the CCC recommended that this pathway was consistent with achieving net zero carbon. By that I mean carbon dioxide, CO2, which is the greenhouse gas that contributes most to warming. So most of our energy emissions are carbon, and most of our carbon emissions are from energy. So the two are largely the same thing. So this means that our proposed objective within the energy strategy is, is put forward as net zero carbon energy by 2050. However, the second part of that vision is around affordable energy. So decarbonizing our energy will require significant investment in low carbon technologies and supporting infrastructure. Now this investment is anticipated to deliver cost savings as we replace the cost of importing fossil fuels. Indeed, the Committee for Climate Change advises that the additional cost of meeting that zero across the UK will be entirely cancelled out due to these savings. For Northern Ireland, this means £34 billion of additional capital investment. However, it's not until 2040 when the operational savings from this outweigh the upfront costs. So it's not just about choosing the quickest pathway to net zero, it's also about identifying the right pathway for Northern Ireland that maintains affordable energy during this transition. So both of these things have to be considered together, and that's why they sit there together in, in our vision. 
To support this, we've put forward a framework for the strategy which identifies five principles upon which we intend for all energy policies to sit under. These are placing you, as in our consumers, our businesses and society more broadly, at the heart of our energy future. Growing a green economy to ensure that we deliver long-lasting economic benefits from our energy policies. Doing more with less to reduce the overall energy we use while supporting a growing economy and population. Replacing fossil fuels with indigenous renewables based around our world-leading natural resources. And also creating a flexible and integrated energy system around us that is focused on achieving the best outcomes for consumers and also ensuring a resilient and secure supply of energy. So at our consultation, we will also include a range of purely illustrative scenarios to demonstrate how different the energy system in the future could be as we seek to achieve net zero carbon energy. And we'll also outline some of our more detailed thinking around the development of supporting energy policies uh, within those five principles to provide everyone the opportunity to help to shape the development of those policies over the coming months. So I hope that's been a helpful short overview uh, for the session. Uh, and obviously, we provided the, the paper alongside it. So, so very happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks very much, Thomas and Richard. Um, and I have to say, I'm really pleased to, to see that we're at this stage, that the, the um, consultation is going to be published next week. Um, I think there is a lot of really positive um, things that have been highlighted in, in your, your briefing, um, none of it w that I would um, disagree with. And I suppose just wanted to pick up on um, one of the points that was at the end of the, the briefing document there in relation to things that will be progressed in the next 12 to 18 months alongside the the, the strategy itself um, in line with the um, Economic Recovery Action Plan. Is, is there maybe a wee bit more detail that you can speak to in relation to that and how it fits with the, um, with the strategy itself? Yes, of, of course, happy to. Um, so, I mean, we have said we are, we are developing a long-term strategy here that's looking out in 2050 and trying to identify the, the right pathway for Northern Ireland towards net zero but carbon but also affordable energy um, but we have set out those areas that we've tried to progress over the last number of months alongside it um, one thing i would maybe draw attention to is the the economic recovery action plan that was published just a few weeks ago by the department where we're growing the green economy was one of the key principles in it and it identified a range of potential measures that we could look to develop over the next 12 to 18 months which of course will be alongside the development of our energy strategy um, and that included a number of areas including looking at, at how we support domestic retrofit and starting to develop plans and proposals for that over the coming months it looked at a green innovation challenge fund and how we support innovation that needs to start now and to take advantage of areas for example around the hydrogen economy and new technologies um, also opportunities around for example micro generation solar pv um, so there are a number of areas within that to progress uh, but i think i think that has to be our key message here is that we'll, we'll put out the consultation next week um, it isn't just areas to look at for the future it isn't putting things off on the long finger it is very much things we want to go we want to take forward now to help inform forward some of those inform some of those longer term policies um, and also starting to develop work on those policies now thanks thomas um Sinead, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight because i know Sinead has to leave so if she wants to get her question in first <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the update and I'm really delighted um, that the options uh, consultation is coming out uh, next week. Um, it's a step forward. But uh, just on the, at the time scale, um, Thomas and Richard, uh, the UN climate change uh, conference is obviously taking place in Glasgow uh, in November. Would you agree that it's important that Northern Ireland um, is, is, is there with a very ambitious um, strategy, energy strategy. Um, I, I, and I'm concerned just at the time scale, you know, this is a very fast moving uh, policy area. And, you know, when we do your policy and, uh, and have our strategy, it's going to be very much a very live document because of, of, of the nature of the actual policy area. But I really do feel that Northern Ireland needs to be at the table but with a very ambitious uh, energy strategy in place. Uh, and um, I th it's not that we're dragging our feet, but it just feels like we are. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a really important point that you raise. Um, we are, um, well, first of all, 
Northern Ireland has been taken forward in terms of arrangements for COP26 by DERA, who lead on the climate change work. But we are we are engaged with with DERA on a weekly basis because, as Thomas mentioned, two third of the two thirds of the challenge is in energy. Um, we briefed, for example, last week into the the meeting at the White House on St Patrick's Day. One of the really exciting things is the interest in climate change now coming from the US. And that is in the context of COP26, where there is, a, you know, where it is, you know, the feedback from officials um, in that briefing, for example, was they were delighted with the progress that we're making. So I'm encouraged that we're not dragging our feet. And that's why the minister has already gone very public on the fact that our target for renewable electricity will be at least 70% by 2030. The renewable industry welcomed that. Uh, give them the direction of travel to be able to continue the plan and the development of their projects. She also said that we should be at the forefront of the hydrogen economy. And the feedback we've had from the COP26 organizers is they, they, they want to focus less on strategy and what we're actually doing. And what we want to do is put our work in the shop window. Uh, as, of, as of now, we are producing the first green hydrogen in these islands. Um, that has been done at an NI water, wastewater treatment site. And that is demonstrating that, uh, from their perspective, they're looking at utilizing the oxygen to expand the capacity of their wastewater treatment works, where there, are, there are, as we know, there are real capacity issues. And the hydrogen ultimately will be used all been well for uh, fueling the buses, the buses that are rolling off the production line in at Wright Bus. So TransLink have already procured three hydrogen buses. Um, we want green hydrogen from electrolysis from our wind to be to be the fuel for them, and there's a further 20 buses due before the end of, of this year, and and that's the story we want to be telling because that plays back to how we want to be leaders in certain areas. No point in trying to be leaders in some of the energy areas where there's billions and billions of pounds been spent around the world already, but our opportunity here is that we lead with the 49% of renewable electricity, and we have the opportunity because of that leadership to understand how we utilize the electricity that is, that is from time to time being curtailed because the demand for it isn't there. And part of that is in electrolysis. So I think we are showing some thought leadership. We're demonstrated by some pilots. And as Thomas said, the creation of the Innovation Fund is about investing in ideas and investing in the research and innovation that will leave us on the front foot and continuing to lead over our near neighbors. Thanks, uh, Sinead. Can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, I maybe have to declare an interest in this field as I have a private member's bill at an advanced stage. It's currently at the drafters in terms of bringing forward uh, proposals around a private member's bill and renewable energy, but that is, is a discussion for another day. But it's certainly, and I look forward to the consultation being published and will respond in due course. One of the areas, and when you look at climate change and, and climate change bills, and we've seen attempts to um, pit the rural and farming community against climate change on the false claim that they are going to pay for it in terms of their industry wages and livelihoods. But one of the things in concerns of renewable energy is that it has to be affordable to consumers uh, and we have to ensure that renewable energy sources are affordable and sustainable, obviously, to, to, to hard-pressed consumers. What, what factors or what account has been taken of that in bringing forward the consultation on the strategy. I'll ask Thomas to come in in a moment. Um, and again, really, really important issue. I mean, some, something that I'm particularly passionate about, um, having worked for nearly a decade in the, in the fuel poverty sector, is the opportunity that more stable renewable energy prices brings to tackling fuel poverty, which part of the reasons why it hasn't been tackled properly is the volatility. Yeah, in, in fossil fuel prices, it's up and down and on all over the place. Affordability is right at the centre and the options consultation contains an, a lot on, on consumers and, and affordability. You know, it's really important that we, that we tackle those issues. And the, the final point I'd make before I hand over to Thomas is the, um, the opportunity to rebalance the economy. Um, you know, it, it is the conurbations and the towns that use the majority of the energy and yet with the renewable energy opportunity, it's typically rural areas that would produce not energy. And it's the rural areas that are 
that are behind the export of 240 million pounds of rocks each year across England and Wales, which is exactly the policy intention where we're producing the energy and using it ourselves and then also been able to export it effectively to the value of the local rural economy. So I think the concept of sustainable farm going forward can be can be born out of this climate change, something you know really positive and, and active. Anything else, Thomas, I missed? Um, I suppose it's just worth saying that, I guess this is why we've put affordability, affordable energy as part of our vision statement, because every single thing we want to do through the energy strategy has to go against that vision. Uh, it has to achieve net zero carbon energy and it has to maintain affordable energy. So it is the most prominent thing up there at the top of our vision on, on that. And, and that's really there to shape all our uh, energy policies um, that we develop through this is understanding the most cost effective routes to do that. Um, that covers a number of things. It covers what the, what the right technologies are for Northern Ireland. It covers what the most cost effective pathways are and it covers when as well. I think that's a really important thing because when we talk about these new technologies coming forward, um, a number of them might not be commercially viable at the moment, but they will take a bit of time to reach that sort of maturity. So there's a question around when we do some of these things that will be part of our consideration as well. And what I would say is this has been the reason for the focus on evidence. Is It's not just evidence about what can deliver net zero carbon. It's evidence about when will the technologies be ready, when will the markets be ready, and when can it be done in a cost-effective way that maintains energy affordability. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. And I suppose just to pick up on that, that point around affordability, because, you know, I think and we've, we've discussed this before, the need for the, the just transition approach to decarbonisation. And even over the past number of weeks, we have seen you know, the increased gas prices, and, and obviously they're coming off at a lower price last summer. Um, but you, ha you spoke to there, Richard, about that volatility. And because you know, gas prices are regulated here, when they fluctuate, they go up and down. And, and those, I suppose, who are least able to afford it, those in fuel poverty, are more likely to, to bear the brunt of that. Um, in terms of those fluctuations. So are there specific interventions being planned within the strategy itself to support those who can at least afford it to be able to transition to you know, renewable um, sources? And um, you mentioned specifically, Thomas, the, uh, the retrofitting um, programme, which I'm really pleased to hear. But is, are, are there other things specifically within the strategy that would um, ensure that everybody can um, transition to, to renewable energy sources? On, yes, but, yeah. Sorry, so I suppose what I'll say is the one of the principles is around placing you at the centre of, of our energy future and that is very much at, at the heart of this question. So as part of that we've identified four consumer populations um, of which one is domestic consumers with particularly with vulnerable characteristics that we need to, to help support and enable through this transition. So we've identified those specific groups and we, what do we, want, we want to make sure is as, as, as we're developing energy policies in all our areas, we test those policies, those policies sorry, against each of those groups of consumers. Um, and indeed the approach we want to take out in the, out in the options consultation is one around enabling and protecting. And what that means is for people who are able to take advantage of some of the opportunities that will come from this, we, we have a range of, of options to, to, to enable them. But for those people here un, unable to, um, such as the people you've mentioned, we're there to protect them as well. So that's a cross-cutting principle and a cross-cutting issue that has to cut through the centre of all the policies that we develop. If I would just quickly add that um, we have, you know, in, in government has had a track record of targeting policy appropriately in this area. And certainly the expectation is that the lower income households would be subject, they would, they would have the potential access to 100% grants, whereas in the able to pay, obviously that would not be the, would not be the case. So I think combining that with the idea that community energy is going to be really important going forward, the idea of uh, cooperatives and, and proper collaboration at a local level, it provides a real opportunity and that's, that's the opportunity that the renewable energy revolution provides for, for local communities to become properly involved and ensure that everybody everybody benefits in a, in, in a just transition way. Thanks, um, Richard. That, that's where I was going next. So you have, you have covered that one for me. But if I could just maybe ask you, you referred um, in your, your initial comments to this being um, to the green hydrogen um, in relation to, you know, that being the, the technology that's being um, developed. Um, and just 
in ensuring that it is green hydrogen? Is there safeguards being put in place around that? Could I just ask, clarify what you mean by safeguards? Well, so I suppose, as opposed to having, you know, the blue hydrogen model, so where the 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 electrolysis would be from fossil fuel generation, in terms of it being from renewable sources. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the 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 challenge for us here is what Thomas alluded to earlier that um, it's when uh, and how much it's going to cost, and and this. Big picture tells us that it'll be 2040. It suggests that it'll be 2040 before the the benefits that come from the investment, you know, the costs of the investment will be offset by the benefits. So we we don't want to be increasing the burden on consumers too early, and yet we've got to get to zero. And things like the life cycle of vehicles on the road, boilers, etc., means that decisions have to be taken quickly in some cases to ensure that we're getting, you know, we're going along the pathway. There is no silver bullet to actually um, get from A to zero, if you like. Um, it's going to need a lot of different things. So whilst we have the potential to be the leaders in the production of green hydrogen, I think for a time, you know, across the world, not just potentially here, there is an opportunity with blue hydrogen, which involves um, steam methane reform of fossil fuel and capturing the carbon and so for example um we one of the one of the big challenges that we face is that as we increase the renewables in electricity how do we keep the lights on in the middle of the winter when there's peak demand when it's dark and when the wind doesn't blow and that's something that's been tackled you know thankfully we'll be working off the solutions that are generated elsewhere in the world but one of the important things is that We've gone from three major thermal plants, but it's those thermal plants that will potentially provide the security supply and the backup for when the wind doesn't blow and when the sun doesn't shine. And it's in those plants we've gone from burning coal and oil to natural gas and Kilroot will be converted by 2023 to natural gas. The next step will be to decarbonize that gas. And the good news is we've got the attention of everybody and we'll be able to look at the opportunity that that, that creates in terms of the, the long-term future of the thermal plants we're using the carbon gas of the future. So I hope that helps. Yep, it does, Richard. Thank you. Um, Stuart, sure. can we bring Stuart in to the spotlight, please? Yep. Um, Again, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, apologies for not being in for the, the, the full run of your, your presentation this morning, but one area, uh, Thomas, I think we had reference, sorry, uh, one comment that Thomas made was reference to those who are protected uh, as customers. But there are groups of people who are not protected as customers, primarily those who use home heating oil, which is over 65% in Northern Ireland, and those that use LPG uh, as opposed to mains gas in Northern Ireland. And as the transition will proceed over the, over the years, uh, presumably f fossil fuels and fossil fuel production facilities will become uh, will become less and there's a potential for the cost of those fuels to rise uh, in terms of production and processing them. So I, there, a balance needs to be struck and there is a deficit in Northern Ireland because home heating oil and LPG is not uh, um, controlled in any shape or form uh, and it does need to be, regulation does need to be considered in respect of that. Do you have a view on that? Uh, if I if I start so that that again is a really good question and it's a big question and it's a very it's at the heart of the consultation document in in the heat section. Um, I mean the important aspect here is that we're dealing with facts that are, that are into the evidence base and not opinions. And there's no doubt you don't have to scratch the surface too hard in this whole area of energy to to raise a lot of emotions and opinions. And you're absolutely right. Um, you know, 65% of homes in Northern Ireland still use heating oil. So what we're encouraging the, if you like, the industry and the non-industry and society at large to do in reply to the consultation is to tackle, is, is to provide the evidence on these issues that, so that we can make the policy decisions that land for what we can do over the next few years along the pathway to 2050. 
So, for example, if you talk to the heat and oil industry, they will say that there is a non-fossil fuel alternative to heat and oil. It's a bio, biofuels, for example. So we need to see whether these will emerge. You know, we need to see whether they will remain niche product or whether they will be done in volume. You can, you can drive past on the road today HGVs that actually say we are using biofuel, for example. So, you know, it does exist, but can it be expanded in an affordable way? Big, big challenges. One of the other things that will be proposed in the document will be to look at the on the gas grid where you've got the potential decarbonization and, and even the climate change committee on that point have started to discuss the prospect of hybrid heat pumps where you've got a electricity providing the base load and the decarbonized gas providing the flexibility and effectively the storage for when the for when the wind doesn't blow but off the gas grid i think we'll have to move quite quickly to the idea of heat pumps testing heat pumps in the rural location and the big challenge is there of, of retrofit and making homes ready for heat pumps so we're looking again that thomas alluded to earlier the technology isn't quite there for high uh, high temperature heat pumps which is which would you know which would reduce the amount of retrofit required very very challenging and we've got to do it in a way that is as keeps me getting mentioned here is affordable to everybody so really good questions and they're at the heart of the consultation thank you thanks stuart i'm going to bring john stewart into the spotlight please yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Thomas and Richard, for the presentation support. It really has been enlightening. Um, I, I want to echo um, just Julian's comments around that time frame. I think a lot within the sector are really eagerly awaiting this. But as I've said to them, I think given how long we've waited, it's important to do it right. And the fact that you've gone to such lengths for full consultation, it's important given the gravity of this document that you know it is done properly. So um, I really appreciate your ongoing work in this. Um, Stuart touched on, on one aspect. I mean, I live in a rural community, so I know what it's like. And as much as we'd love to have pipe gas and ultimately, you know, green gas down the line, it's just not practical because we're 700 metres from the main road and we're five miles from the nearest pipeline. So I'm just, uh, I know that you've been teasing this out in the consultation, but I'm interested to get, you know, how over time do we get to the, the rural communities? Because towns over time, I think, will more and more connect to the network and be able to access this green energy. But I think our rural communities will struggle. And as Stuart says, potentially be even paying even more for that access. I mean, what um, strategies and what technology do you think are in place coming down the road that could target the rural sector? Thomas, do you want to start there? Or do you want yeah, to I do indeed. I suppose it's, it's just, uh, I suppose just to reiterate a point to Richard, mentioned which was I think we recognize that the options available for people are different depending on whether you're on the gas grid or off the gas grid and so we have to look at it that way we can't just um, there's one solution that will fit everyone and we have to actually do the other solution as to what people's options are and what's the right thing for them. What I would say is the, the, almost the starting point for, for any of this has to be about the buildings we live in and about reducing the need to heat it so I think that's that's the first principle is I think particularly that you know some of our housing stock is, is in great condition some of it is okay and some of it isn't and we really need to target particularly those properties that aren't in great condition um that, that might be some of those properties that you're talking about uh john as well first but then we get of course to what's the potential technologies and solutions that might be there for them and, and that's that's at the heart of of the work we're doing on evidence and on and the consultation and richard's also mentioned about can things like biofuels play an interim role there is the question longer term then around the role that heat pumps, for example, can play in, in off-grid properties and rural properties. And they're the kind of things that we want to actually trial and demonstrate. We want to test those things in people's homes to see how they work and to see whether they're applicable or not. So that's, that's part of the consultation. Part of what we want to do is understand what the right options and solutions are for people in exactly the circumstances you, you, you've just uh, stated. Oh, you're right. I, I, would, I would just quickly add that... Um, you know, and what Thomas says, energy efficiency first is really important because you get your best bang for your buck, so to speak, by, by making your house more efficient. And, and while we are working very closely with DERA and the concept of sustainable farm, they obviously recognize that well, the majority of rural properties are not farms. So that this is one of the biggest challenges. You know, it's, it's how do we ensure that we can get uh, fully green energy uh, in the rural, loca rural location? And it's it's not going to be easily solved. And so I think the early trials on the likes of heat pumps and, and affordable heat pump technology is, is going to be one of the answers. But, you know, again, 
I suspect that more of the government support is going to have to be focused on the rural area because it's it's not going to be as readily solved. Going to just ask, do you think this is going to be the hardest fight out of all? I mean, how we address that problem in the rural communities, but I think you just said that, that these are difficult areas to get to and it's going to require creative thinking undoubtedly over time. One last thing, if I may do, Chair, you'll be aware, um, Janice, that this week there was the private members' bill moved around climate change, and you said already that the department is, is working on their own. I'm just wanting to get your feeling for how important it is to have that overlap and collegiate approach between the department through the energy strategy and climate change legislation, um, given that you know, the, there is that massive overlap in it, um, and what role did the interview played in feeding into that? And how important will their legislation hopefully be um, sitting alongside the energy strategy? Yeah, if I, if I could pick that up, I mean, it, the, the, we're, we work very closely with effectively the Climate Change League, which is in DERA, uh, and as I say, on, on a weekly basis. Um, DERA has established a, an interministerial group, and, and notwithstanding the private members' bill that has come forward this, this week. Um, you know the the last inter the first in the inaugural in, interministerial group. Um, there was such unity across the whole the whole, all the departments that were represented. You know you know as you would expect ourselves DFI DFC DOF and DERA and uh, you know they, the the group was addressed by Chris Stark, who's the chief executive of the committee for climate change, and, and he he reflected to me afterwards that he was really encouraged by the, the the single purpose that came across and the enthusiasm that they came across so at least we're not at that point in the principle we're not arguing we're all we understand there needs to be a collective way forward and what we've done in, so far in the work on the energy strategy part of that is that we have a formal gov cross government working group and this is not going to be an economy energy strategy this is going to be an executive energy strategy because it is it is truly cross cutting yeah. okay Thank you for that, both of you today. Appreciate it. Look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, John. Um, Richard and Thomas, could I just maybe ask a wee bit more about the, the community um, buy-in piece and, and what is maybe being proposed around that in terms of how we empower communities and also, I suppose, encourage um, to, to kind of support renewable energy um, projects and initiatives? And, and maybe just ask for your views around um, planning policy in this area as well. Um, it's a difficult enough issue. And if you see the need for um, development or um, revision of planning policy, and you know sometimes there may be difficult decisions and difficult pro proposals that are, are there for communities and how that can be done better and how it needs to be done better if we're actually to um, make the progress that we need to? Well, if I start, and, and, and Thomas has a lot to say about this as well, because he's at the heart of this. Um, I mean, we're trying to learn from the best practice elsewhere, whether it's in other parts of this island or whether it's across in GB. And there are some fantastic examples of what's been achieved in terms of community engagement in Scotland, for example, with the development of both hydro and wind projects. And these are the most important thing that strikes us is that this is not about um, money been provided up front to get something through planning. This is about a, an engagement with the community for the lifetime of the project. So there are fine examples, as I say, from the past 10 or 15 years of ongoing support into the local community. Th those projects that we've seen, we, we've, we've looked at, you know, they've really been refined over the years. They're, they're, they're projects that provide infrastructure to the local community, like community uh, centres and so on, but it's also about getting into the fabric and the daily life of the community. It's about services. And I think that's where we get to the, the point that Thomas was making earlier about empowering consumers as part of this transition, being able to, you know, we've gone from a very centralised energy system to a decentralised energy system so far, 23,600 generators across the country. And there's just going to be more of that, the opportunity for people to participate, for everybody to participate. And, and the community angle, that's really important. And the final thing I would say is that one of the things we must consider is mandating, is legislation to mandate the actual support for the community as part of the projects that get developed. And, and John mentioned a, a moment ago in his question about the, the challenges in the rural community. We have to ensure that the rural community 
really does realize the benefits of this and part of that will be mandating the development of energy projects in the rural community so that they see the benefit for the lifetime of the project over the next 20 or 30 years. And ju just to add, I guess, from the consultation itself, I mean, that this is a really important issue that, that pops up in a couple of different areas. So as we look to, to grow our Indigenous Renewables base, you know, we want to have public support for this, for what we're trying to do, um, alongside the support that there is for addressing climate change. So, you know, there, there is us looking at what are the right technologies as we, as we, as we take forward um, additional renewable generation. There is also looking at the strategic location of future, renew future renewable generation to understand what works best, uh, both for networks, for developers, and also for society and people. Uh, and also that community benefits piece and the community engagement piece, uh, how we make sure that local communities are involved in these projects and in their areas. But but I think it's not just it's not just that, it's also that empowering piece that Richard mentioned. And what we do need to look is, is to see how can we actually empower people as part of the energy transition to, to decarbonised energy um, by giving them opportunities to participate in markets and potential revenue streams that are there, by looking at how we support active consumers and also particularly the community energy piece, how we can help to bring communities together to look at how they can both reduce the energy they use and what's the right energy for them as a community. So there's quite a lot in there in a few different areas that I think will be very relevant and very interesting to some of the points raised. No, thanks very much for that. Uh, and uh, I think all of what you said is really positive and it chimes with a, a lot of what we have heard as a committee. And um, and I, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear, Richard, that um, you're considering mandating um, the the community benefit piece as part of this as well. I think that that will be um, welcomed by, by, you know, many rural communities. Um, certainly, you know, the, the bigger companies do provide some community benefit, but there, there isn't that, I suppose, um, framework around it that, uh, that obligates it. So I think that that is an important piece. Um, and I completely agree with the, the empowering communities aspect of this is, I suppose, one of I, the ways that I see of, of really making it a success. So um, I'm really encouraged by, by what we've heard this morning and I'm really looking forward to seeing the, um, the strategy or the consultation when you publish it next week. So um, thanks very much. I don't think we have anybody else coming in for questions. questions. Chair. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Bye. Um, unless there is anything else that we no, need to follow up from that? No, Chair. What we basically look at now is once once the consultation comes in, it means that we have something more to look at in terms of um, balancing it against what the committee's micro-inquiry special report details in terms of themes, but also beginning to talk again to our stakeholders. Obviously, an analysis of the consultation will come, but I think it's certainly the, the, the level of, of interest in this in the committee means that I think we probably discuss the consultation anyway, even though we reserve the, the committee's position as super consultee. Um, also, um, I suppose from the perspective of whether there are additional uh, issues members want to raise that aren't going to be covered in the consultation as well or, or I guess that's always the problem with the consultation, is it's been drafted by the time we see it. But um, it's, it's something, I think, to, for committee to reflect on, just in case there are gaps there. Okay. But other than that... So unless we'll members have anything they want to add, we'll move on. Okay. Nope. So um, next item is any other business, and none has been nope. indicated. So um, then we are looking at our date, time and place of the next meeting, which... Um, will be after Easter, so it's Wednesday the 14th of April here in room 30. So that is um, the meeting adjourned. Thank Thanks. you very much. Sure, do we have an informal meeting tomorrow? Oh, sorry, Stuart. Yes, we do. We have an informal meeting with Ulster University at 11. Yeah. And the um, details, I think, have been circulated. Yeah, the details have been circulated. And we just, if members just check to make sure they got the team's invite for that, if they haven't, let us know and we reissue. Yes, I have. Got it. Great. Thank you. Sure, I'm hoping to attend that meeting and I have a meeting beforehand which may run over. So if I don't attend, you put my apologies in. Sure. Will do, John. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.